All right, so we're just going to give it a minute just for everyone to enter because it looks like everyone is entering the webinar. So we're just going to give it about a minute or so. Okay, so it looks like um, the amount of attendees entering is starting to kind of slow down. So I'm gonna get started just with a few housekeeping things. So um, my name is Margo Villegas. I am a genomic science liaison at Ambry Genetics. Um, I cover specialty in the Northeast. I'm also a genetic counselor. Um, and with me here today, I have um, Arthur Vilda and Cynthia James, um, and they're going to be doing a presentation for us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so before I do some introductions, um, we got to go over the regular housekeeping things um, that we all hear. Um, So um, some reminders. So some of our automatic emails may arrive to your junk folder. So just make sure to add us to known senders. Um, so for the NSGC, we do offer CEUs um, for the live session only, but you have to enter through the GoToWebinar link and make sure you do the survey at the end of the webinar. Um, if you call into the session, you unfortunately are unable to claim CEUs. Um, and then you receive 0.1 um, CEUs um, and one contact hour per webinar awarded. And then at the end of the series, you will receive your CEUs. So it's best to register with your personal email in case you change, change positions, excuse me. And make sure you provide your NSGC ID number um, on the survey. Um, and if you're not an NSGC member, make sure that you create a guest account. Um, we also offer um, PACE certificates as well, and make sure you keep track of your own participation so that you can verify that the correct amount of CEUs are um, correct that you've earned. And if you have any questions, please make sure to email us. So some logistics. So everyone is automatically muted when you enter the webinar. Um, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available on Ambry's website. Um, there's a control panel on the right side of your screen and you can hide the control panel and view the webinar in full screen if you wish. If you have any questions, um, we will be monitoring questions um, and our speakers have kindly offered to stay to answer questions. Um, so please feel free to do so as we go and then at the end we will um, try our best to answer them. Um, and then the survey will pop up in the web browser um, when you close the webinar and you will get an email about an hour after the presentation. Okay, great. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the speakers and then hand it over to them. Um, so first we have um, Dr. Arthur Vilda um, and he's the head of the Department of Clinical and Experimental Cardiology at the University of Amsterdam Medical Center in the Netherlands. His clinical and research interests include the care of patients with arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, electrophysiology, and genetic factors contributing to sudden death. And for our second presenter, we have Dr. Cynthia James, um, and she is a, an assistant professor at, of medicine in cardiology and a certified genetic counselor at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And her research focus, is focused on cardiovascular genetic counseling and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. 
Both presenters are writing group members of the 2019 HRS expert consensus statement on evaluation, risk stratification, and management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy um, and the topic for today's webinar. So thank you both so much. Um, and um, thank you. I'm going to pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, good day to all of you and a good evening from Amsterdam. Uh, so my name is Arthur Villa. I'm working in Amsterdam University Medical Center, and this is on behalf of uh, SETS and the European uh, Reference Network uh, for Rare and Low Prevalence Complex Diseases, which are all uh, in this domain, that the ones that we discussed today. So the, the main uh, document that we will discuss is this, uh, as already mentioned, this 2019 HRS expert consensus statement on the evaluation, risk stratification, and management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And I will discuss uh, these issues and Dr. James will discuss the genetic approach to these uh, patients and the lifestyle adjustments. We were both a um, writing member of this um, document. So when do you speak of a arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? There needs to be some kind of ventricular dysfunction. And in those patients where the arrhythmia is the clinical presentation, uh, you can uh, diagnose the patient with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. If there is only left ventricular dysfunction and no arrhythmia as a primary presentation or you know, at all, then the patient does not have uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and you have to consider other acquired conditions like ischemic heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, etc. Within the group of uh, arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy are also some other diseases that are considered systemic disorders, like sarcoid or myocarditis or Chagas or amyloid. And they are not considered in the subgroup of arrhythmogenic <coughs> cardiomyopathy. So the ventricular dysfunction in this um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is either at the right side and then it's the original name is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It can also be at the left side, and when it's solely at the left side, it's arrhythmogenic left ventricular cardiomyopathy, and it can also be in both, and then it's a biventricular disease. The common pathways include the cellular structures like the desmosomes or the intercalated disc or ion channels, mainly at the right side of the disease. Uh, but ion channels and diseases in the sarcomere or the sarcoposmetic reticulum also involve the left side, and many of them actually also are biventricular. Genetic variants, which will be discussed in detail by Cynthia, um, are here. Some of them are rather specific for the uh, right side for cardiomyopathy, and others are either found in the isolated left or both. So I'll start with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and I'll start with the diagnosis of that disease. So this is a typical EKG of a patient with uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It has all the aspects. There is a arrhythmia here, which comes from the, the right ventricular apex. It has a fractionated complex in the right precordial leads. It has this little blip at the end, which is considered an epsilon wave. But it also has some minor um, voltages, some, some decreased voltages here at the left side, which means that this patient also has left ventricular involvement. The clinical presentation is thus somebody with arrhythmias with a left frontal branch block, palpitations, dizziness, or can be sudden death. And the substrate is in the right ventricle, typically, the right ventricle stint. The muscle, is the, the, the red color here is the muscle, is replaced by a fatty fibrous tissue and that leads to a very thin wall at the right ventricle. And the pathology here shows that there is a massive fatty infiltration in this particular example. The ARVC criteria uh, are from several uh, domains. They are from the imaging site, echo or MRI. <clears throat> they can be from histology, but histology is rarely available. Only in particularly in disease patients. The EKG, I already showed you, is a very important feature in the diagnosis of arrhythmogenic right ventricular, uh, uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and it involves negative T waves in the right precordial leads and epsilon wave 
the arrhythmias are obviously of importance and they are uh, non-sustained or sustained ventricular tachycardias mainly arising from the right ventricle as also in this case and there is the family history uh, and the genetics uh, that can be performed and all these um, criteria um, do get points i'm not going through the whole list of uh, criteria because it's a very detailed list but in the end for the diagnosis of arvc you need uh, two major uh, criteria or one major and one and two minor or four minor criteria so you can up in, in the document is the list that's a full page uh, where all these criteria are mentioned and explained so in the workup of a patient that you consider uh, acm or arvc you need an ekg you need an exercise ekg you need a halter and you need a signal average ekg uh, for imaging modalities echo and mri are the ideal uh, imaging modalities uh, and genetic testing is obviously of importance <clears throat> this is a typical ekg uh, from a patient who was uh, resuscitated at 38 years of age and also here you can see the in the right ventricle leads the negative t waves here in v, v2 v3 v4 v5 uh, and what you also see here is a lot of ventricular ectopy and if you look carefully i don't have the time to go through all the details but the ventricular ectopy actually arises from three sites in the right ventricle, which in the original description of the disease were considered the pre deliction site of ARVC. One is from the uh, right ventricular outflow tract, one is from the right ventricular free wall, and one is from the right ventricular apex. And, and with this uh, resuscitated male and EKG like this, you can be sure that the disease uh, here is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia or ACM. So genetic testing, I, I have added this slide, but uh, Cynthia will go over in detail. I just had added it because as will uh, be shown in the later slides, genetic testing is very important because the underlying genetic defect means a lot for the, um, uh, for the risk stratification. The risk stratification is actually the most important uh, issue in this disease or in these diseases, I should say, and that is uh, when do you reach the decision for an ICD and the first thing to mention and that is a class one which is indicated by these green boxes class one recommendation is that the decision to implant an ICD in an ind individual with ACM should also should always be a shared decision between the patient and the physician the, the doctor should explain in detail what the risk and benefits of the ICD are and uh, over the potential longevity of the patient. So patients who uh, should be, where the discussion should be, be done is obviously a patient after a cardiac arrest or after a sustained VT that is not hemodynamically tolerated. In all these cases, um, there is a class one recommendation for um, an uh, ICD implantation. So that is either suffered from a cardiac arrest with uh, VT or VF ICD is recommended, or in those cases where there is a sustained VT that is not well tolerated. That is a class one uh, indication in all patients. If there was no cardiac arrest or, or hemodynamically unstable VT, but if there was a hemodynamically stable VT or a syncopal event suspected to be due to ventricular arrhythmia, then you can already see that the genetics come into play because it is a class one uh, recommendation in individuals with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy other than ARVC and that is mainly based on the genetic the genetics and uh, there it is a class one and the other patients it is a class 2a if you go one step further down so there is no uh, clinically relevant arrhythmia or no syncopal event then the, the result of genetic testing uh, is here. And if you are dealing with a phospholambda mutation or an FLNC mutation or a laminac, uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and left trick rejection fraction is below 45%. All these have a class 2A recommendation for an ICD. So even in an asymptomatic patient with a um, uh, ejection fraction below 45%, 
if the patient is a carrier of a pathogenic phospholamine mutation or a lamin AC or FLNC and ICD uh, consider is already reasonable. Uh, I'll give you a few examples, EKG examples of these diseases. This is a PLN case, and this is obviously a very seriously affected patient. This is end stage heart failure. In the extremity leads, the QRS complexes are almost gone, and only the exosystole here uh, is shown. Uh, in the precordial leads, uh, there is still some uh, QRS complex seen, uh, but it's very minor. And this actually is the hallmark of PLN disease, uh, very uh, small uh, QRS complexes, low voltages in the extremity leads, and this is an extreme form. But also in this patient, who is only 23 year old and completely asymptomatic, you can already see that there is uh, low voltage of the normal complexes in the extremity leads. And here there is, there is ventricular bigeminy with ventricular exosystoles, which are monomorphic, as you can see here, and have a left frontal bench block. And then an inferior axis is there, originate from the right ventricular atrotec. But the hallmark here, this a young patient asymptomatic is the low voltage PLN disease. And the typical hallmark for a lemon AC case, this is also an asymptomatic individual, 32 years of age, but a very significant family history of sudden death and heart failure. Uh, and the patient can be recognized here by the wide PQ interval, PR interval. You can see it's much prolonged. It's over 300 milliseconds. QS complex is completely normal. Reprosation is completely normal. But the only abnormality is the wide PR interval and the low voltage P wave, which is also typical for lamin AC. So these EKG signs are actually red flags uh, in this uh, domain. And the two diseases are more malignant than other diseases uh, in the dilated cardiomyopathy, as you can see from this slide, which is from our group published in 2013, where the endpoint death from any cause, uh, heart transplant and malignant ventricular arrhythmias are shown for different uh, subgroups. And as you can see, both the PLM and lemon AC are at the bottom here. So that, that is a more serious disease. And part of it is, is the arrhythmia burden, is the life-threatening arrhythmia burden. So we were at this point, um, a low ejection fraction um, below, we were here, we now go uh, further down, the ejection fraction is below 35%, and that is in all patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, class one indication for an ICD implant, that is the regular guidelines for patients with a low ejection fraction. Um, and if, but if that is not the case, so this is a patient with a complete normal ejection fraction, then you can still operate an ICD if sufficient major or minor criteria are present. So an ICD implantation is reasonable for individuals with ARVC and three major, uh, two major or one minor, and one major and four minor are, are there. And if that is all not there, then you should not consider an ICD. So what are these major and minor criteria? Yeah, the next slide. The major risk factors is the non-sustained PT, inducibility, and a, and a left ejection fraction below 50%. And the minor risk factors are male age, uh, a burden, PVC burden on Holter, RP dysfunction, the probant in the disease, and the presence of one of two or more of uh, genetic uh, variants, pathogenic variants. So in recent years, we have worked uh, together with many groups, and this was led by Hopkins uh, in Baltimore, where Cynthia is working, um, various, developed various risk models, uh, because as you can imagine, many of these risk factors are not uh, yes or no, but they are continuous variables, and like uh, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, risk for these models have also been developed for ARVC. And there is one for all ventricular arrhythmias, and there is one, a later one, for only life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. The first is all ventricular arrhythmias, which was published in 2019 in the European Heart Journal. And the, this was on um, 528 patients who all met the task criteria in 2010 for the diagnosis of ARVC, 
they all had no history of ventricular arrhythmia as a baseline, and they had at least five years, or they had a mean of five years follow up, and 146 reached the endpoint uh, out of this group. And that is uh, shown in this curve. It's a regular decrease uh, after about a year uh, over time. And the endpoint was uh, aborted or sudden cardiac death, ventricular arrhythmia, or an ICD shock. And the risk factors that popped up in the uh, univariate model uh, are here, and in the multivariate model are here. Uh, and as you can see, the, many of them are already mentioned in the previous uh, slides on major and minor risk factors. But um, age is an important one, which was not mentioned before. The recent cardiac syncope is obviously one. The presence of prior non-sustained PT, the PVC count, uh, the number of leads, that is an indication for the extent of the disease, uh, RV ejection fraction and LV ejection fraction. And in the multivariate model, these uh, factors uh, remained. And that leads to an ARVC risk calculator for the development prediction of sustained ventricular arrhythmias. This is something different, as you will see in a minute, from life-threatening life ventricular arrhythmias. Um, but with these, this model, uh, all these uh, factors have a, a certain uh, a, a number in the, in, the, in the formula, and that ends up with the five-year event-free survival uh, that is either low, below 5% over five years, or is very high, over 50% of five years. And obviously, the patient in this group, and the risk is very high in this group, definitely should be considered for an ICD, and a patient in this lower group, probably not. And remember that not every ventricular arrhythmia here is a lethal ventricular arrhythmia. This is the case in this uh, paper, which is on sudden cardiac death prediction. So in this paper with the same authors, it's, uh, not the same patient, the number of patients is a little higher, <coughs> but um, we, we developed a similar risk calculator for life-threatening arrhythmias. And now you can see that in the univariable model, uh, the same um, factors are here. But in the multivariate model, for this particular uh, endpoint, life-threatening disease, for example, prior sustained VT does not uh, uh, make it in the multivariable model, um, which means that if a patient had a monomorphic VT, um, that does not predict that he will get ventricular fibrillation later on. It does predict that you might have another monomorphic VT, but it does not predict the occurrence of fear. A few other remarks. Um, if the patient has uh, inappropriate ICD therapies, a beta blocker therapy is recommended, um, for example, when they occur from supraventricular arrhythmias. In general, beta blocker therapy is a class 2 way uh, recommendation for patients who do not have an ICD. And another issue is uh, the use of antiarrhythmic drugs in patients with uh, recurrent symptomatic arrhythmias. Amiraron and Sotalol have a class 2B. Not too much evidence that they really uh, work. Um, and if they continue to have uh, symptoms and preserved RV and left ventricular function, you can try flecainide. Flecainide can actually be a very effective drug, but you can only use it in patients with preserved RV and LV function. And the last topic is obviously on catheter ablation, which is an important addition to these patients and quite frequently needed. There is a class 2A indication for all individuals with ACM and recurrent symptomatic sustained PTs in whom antiarrhythmic medications are ineffective or not tolerated. And in symptomatic individuals with ACM and a high burden of ventricular ectopy or no sustained PTs, where beta blockers are ineffective. These, the, the, the high burden here may either lead to symptoms or further reduction of LV or RV function. And there is a class to be recommendations for individuals with ACM and recurrent symptomatic sustained PT in whom medical therapy has not failed, may be considered for catheter ablation. So, in summary, um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is very important to recognize. It is important to genotype, and Cynthia will discuss the details in a minute because it's relevant to risk, as I have shown. Risk stratification is well possible. I've also shown that. 
um, and there is an increasing availability of risk calculations calculators in these diseases, but at present only for ARVC. And there are a definite some lifestyle adjustment pertinent, but they also will be discussed by Cynthia. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Vilda, and thank you for this opportunity to um, share with you uh, part two of the webinar on evaluation, risk stratification, and management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, as um, Margo already mentioned, I am a genetic counselor and a genetics researcher. I've spent my career in cardiovascular genetics at Johns Hopkins, specifically associated with the ARVC program, which is now um, older than 20 years, um, was started and is still led by Hugh Hawkins, who's a clinical electrophysiologist. Um, so what I'll do over the next 20 minutes or so is talk a little bit more in depth about genetics and genetic testing and the recommendations in the HRS guideline on those topics. Talk about, um, as Arthur just mentioned, lifestyle factors. So specifically exercise and the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, specifically the data we have on exercise and ARVC and the recommendations made. And then I'll end um, with a case um, that Arthur and I will both contribute to. So to start with genetics and genetic testing. Um, so as Dr. Vilda mentioned, um, the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies are a family of conditions, many of which have a genetic basis, um, some of which do not or may not. And the most common of these are ARVC, ALVC. So um, this inherited cardiomyopathy with a very high risk of sudden cardiac death that in between half and two thirds of cases is associated with a pathogenic variant or likely pathogenic variant in one of the desmosomal genes. Um, but as Arthur described, um, genetic testing is particularly important because these arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies are part of a broader family. And by identifying um, which gene is affected, it has implications not only for cascade screening um, and early detection in the family, but also for management and individualized risk prediction. So in addition to uh, ARVC, ALVC, which are typically associated with uh, mutations in genes encoding the cardiac desmosome, uh, we have um, a disease associated with lamin AC mutations in which uh, conduction disease is common along with ventricular arrhythmias. Um, SCN5A, which many of us know um, is associated with Brugada syndrome in addition to arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. Um, Phospholamban, with, which Arthur just described, he showed you that low voltage ECG. Uh, with high risk of ventricular arrhythmias and prominent heart failure. TMEM43, uh, which is associated with a very, very high risk of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death, particularly in male individuals in the family. There's uh, founder mutations in Newfoundland um, and very high prevalence of TMEM43 arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy there. Filament C, which we're all learning a lot more about, at least those early uh, manuscripts are showing a very high risk of sudden death. Uh, in those cohorts, we'll see as um, we get more population-based data, what the penetrance um, and the risk of sudden death is as time goes on. RBM20 um, associated with dilated cardiomyopathy, atrial arrhythmias, and finally um, families affected with Desmond cardiomyopathy with uh, skeletal myopathy relatively prevalent. Uh, you saw this slide before when Arthur showed it. So when the group came together, I think we've made the point, and certainly we have a class one recommendation that for individuals diagnosed with an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, either while living or on autopsy, uh, genetic testing is recommended um, uh, of the ACM susceptibility genes. And well, how should you do that genetic testing? Um, and we came down in the committee saying, look, for genetic testing, um, we recommend testing all of these ACM susceptibility genes, including um, a, really a comprehensive analysis. And optimally, the interpretation of that genetic test should be done 
um, with a cardiac with a team of providers with expertise in both uh, genetics and cardiology. Uh, cascade testing is also recommended, um, although there's some nuance to that, which we'll get to in a moment. All right, so when we talked about the established genes, what were we talking about? So keep in mind, this document was published in 2019. And at the time, this was the minimum set of genes to be prioritized uh, that we came up with. Um, obviously, the likelihood that your patient in front of you is going to have a variant in any given one of these genes has a lot to do with the phenotype, with the clinical characteristics. Um, but this is uh, the group of genes we came up with as sort of a bare minimum. Um, I'd like to highlight, though, uh, that, of course, when you're looking at the patient in front of you, the phenotype matters, the clinical presentation matters when you're going to um, interpret the genetic test result you've got. Uh, so right here I have boxed in green um, genes that are definitively or mod have moderate evidence for association with ARVC, so the most common arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and genes in yellow with limited evidence. Uh, so obviously if you have a patient in front of you with that looks very much like they have ARVC and you have a definitively pathogenic variant in DSG2, well, that's um, really helpful information. On the other hand, if you look like you have a variant of uncertain significance in bag three, hmm, you've got to really think hard about what that means. Uh, and as I suspect many in the audience know, um, a really helpful resource for making that evaluation of the association of your patient's phenotype with your genetic test result, the likelihood that makes sense, is the um, ClinGen initiative. Many of you know ClinGen is, gosh, about a five-year-old now initiative through the uh, NHGRI, really designed to consolidate evidence for gene disease associations. Um, and so for any gene that you can look at, you can type into there and um, it reports back the association of that gene uh, with any of these uh, diseases of interest. So here is the example of PKP2. And what you'll see here is um, for PKP2, um, according to the panel, which I was a part of, um, when we evaluated published evidence, and ex including clinical data and experimental data, um, PKP2 is has definitive evidence for its association with ARVC, so that's helpful. In contrast, um, the panel, which uh, Dr. Vilda was a part of, uh, disputed the association of PKP2 with Brigada syndrome, um, as did the dilated cardiomyopathy group. So you can see that um, you know, when evaluating a genetic test result, looking at the patient's phenotype, in addition to the variant you have, is really important. All right, so moving on. So um, the HRS panel recommended as a class one recommendation, genetic testing for all probands. Um, we also recommended cascade testing, and there's a little bit of nuance to that. Um, so we recommended that after you take um, a detailed appropriate three generation pedigree, that all first degree relatives, regardless of their genotype, undergo baseline clinical evaluation. And that baseline clinical eval evaluation should include at least a 12 lead ECG, some sort of ambulatory ECG monitoring, so a Holter or a Zeo patch, something like that, and um, some sort of cardiac imaging, um, depending on uh, what imaging expertise you have at your center, as well as um, what the disease in question is. Um, then after that, individuals who have a normal um, cardiovascular investigation and who do not carry the familial variant, um, we can dismiss from screening. On the other hand, um, obviously individuals who have the variant, you know, and have a clinical phenotype, uh, we want to continue to follow, as well as individuals with a, a familial variant who have, um, you know, no indication of disease yet. But the reason we put um, Instead of dismissing people um, outright who do not carry a familial variant, I think all of us who've been in cardiovascular genetics long enough um, are well aware of how much we've learned over time. And so I think um, we've seen uh, variants re-adjudicated 
um, we've seen greater understanding of the complexity of some of these conditions, and we've certainly known that in some learned that in some families there are multiple pathogenic variants playing a role. Uh, so the, the group came together to say, look, you know, at this point in time, this may change in five years. We would recommend everybody have all first degree relatives have a baseline cardiovascular evaluation, and I'm happy to answer questions about that as we move on. All right, so uh, that's the end of the brief overview of genetic testing. I'm gonna move now on to exercise uh, and the recommendations we made for that. So the question of exercise in this document was really focused on um, ARVC, and there were formal questions we were asked to answer. For, our, for patients, it was, should an ARVC patient meeting task force criteria, regardless of symptoms of disease severity, be restricted from strenuous exercise compared to no restriction to prevent um, sustained ventricular arrhythmia or sudden death, as well as structural progression. And for family members, we were asked, should a gene positive phenotype negative family member be restricted from strenuous exercise again, compared to no restriction to prevent um, ARVC disease expression. And as we searched the literature, it's worth mentioning that for ARVC patients, the data is pretty unambiguous. Um, competitive or frequent vigorous or strenuous intensity endurance exercise was associated with sudden cardiac death, earlier onset, worse uh, ventricular structure and function at baseline, worse survival free from ventricular arrhythmias and follow-up, increased likelihood of heart failure or transplant and follow-up, and this was true both in patients with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic desmosomal variant as well as in gene elusive patients. And really that data was consistent across centers in North America and Europe. And really every paper that had looked at this question um, was pretty consistent in that finding. Uh, this is in contrast for what's known in gene po genotype positive phenotype negative relatives. Um, there's some data that exercise is associated with a dose dependent increase in penetrance, as you can see here on this bar chart. Um, there's a dose-dependent increase in the association of extent of right and left ventricular structural dysfunction. That's nice data out of Christina, Haugis Group, and Oslo. There's some evidence for greater likelihood of incident VT, some evidence that AHA recommended minimum exercise for healthy adults falls within a safe level for these individuals. And we certainly have um, mice models with various desmosomal variants fairly consistently showing that exercise promotes disease expression, but there's a lot less data than for affected individuals. Frankly, the data is mostly from two, two groups, one of which is our own, and almost all this data is on PKP2 carriers. All right, so what did we do with that? So um, coming together, the HRS group said, uh, look, we're ready to make a strong recommendation for exercise in ARVC patients. This is the class three harm uh, recommendation saying individuals with ARVC should not participate in competitive or frequent high intensity endurance exercise as this is associated with an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmias and promoting uh, progression of structural disease. So let's pull apart that definition. What is competitive exercise? Uh, we took the definition from the AHA ACC scientific statement for eligibility and disqualification recommendations for athletes. Um, and so you, using this definition, um, competitive athletics, it relates to an organized team or individual sport that requires regular competition against others as a central component, places a high premium on excellence and achievement, and requires some form of systematic and usually intense training. So this is um, an organized activity, um, competition against others, and systematic training. And what is endurance exercise? Again, from the same HAACC document, endurance exercise is essentially aerobic exercise, um, has an inc high dynamic component. So you can see in the red box, it's things like basketball, cross country skiing, um, soccer, things like that. All right, so what was our recommendation for family members? Here, again, it's a strong recommendation. It's a class one recommendation um, but I'll call it into your attention the nuances in the language. So here the recommendation was clinicians should, should counsel adolescent and adult in, individuals with a positive genetic test for ARVC, but who are phenotype negative that competitive or frequent high intensity endurance exercise 
is associated with an increased likelihood of developing ARVC and ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and we really wanted to highlight that aiding patients and especially at-risk family members in making choices about participation in various types of exercise involves ongoing discussion and shared decision-making for all of us who've sat down with patients and families and had these conversations. This is often not an event. This is often a process. Um, and it's also is um, the phenotype changes over time, particularly for at-risk family members. These are decisions that need to be revisited. All right, so putting it all together, at least for patients with ARVC, uh, based on data suggesting that higher exercise intensity and dose are associated with poorer outcomes, vigorous intensity activity, so these up here in the red and the orange, should be done by an ARVC patient rarely, if at all, and these lower intensity activities in green more regularly. Looking at this um, chart in METS, METS are metabolic equivalents, anything above six or so is considered a high intensity or vigorous intensity activity. So it's going to cause substantial increases in heart rate, substantial increases in breathing. And you can imagine these are things like a basketball game here at eight or competitive soccer at 10. Um, activities uh, ranging between uh, a little over three to around six or so is moderate intensity. And you can imagine that here's swimming laps, um, freestyle sort of light to moderate effort. You can imagine that as moderate intensity. Uh, and things right, you know, around three-ish or so and down are low intensity activities. Here they're green for our ARVC patients. Couple of caveats. Um, as I've mentioned a couple times, that exercise data is primarily for PKP2 and gene elusive ARVC, and certainly it's for ARVC specifically. Uh, this is data that we're about to submit tomorrow, actually on a large group of Dutch patients with the Dutch uh, phospholamband founder variant, r 14 del And here you can see that regardless of outcome, uh, individuals who were more active in red and less active in blue um, in, the, in that patient population, so some of those people were affected, some were not, uh, really had no difference. Regardless of what outcome you looked at, individuals who are more or less active had the exact same clinical outcome. And so genotype really matters in exercise guidance. Uh, we can talk about this in more detail later, but I also wanna raise the caveat that uh, this data is on patients and family members of patients. We do not have data on exercise and genotype positive, phenotype negative patients who aren't part of ARVC families, so individuals who have their ident variant identified as an incidental finding or maybe someone who sought proactive genetic testing. Um, the benefit of limiting frequent or high intensity competitive endurance exercise for these patients may be lower, but requires future study. And I'm happy to answer questions about that. We're, we're in a, involved in an ongoing study with the group at Geisinger uh, to evaluate um, the phenotype of those um, genome first patients. All right, so I am going to now move on to a case that I think highlights some of what we just talked about. Arthur, if you want to um, turn your uh, video back on or any uh, and your unmute yourself, we can you can weigh in on this as well. Um, so our case is a 15 year old male competitive swimmer and water polo player uh, who had syncope at practice. Uh, he was pulled from the pool by his coaches and teammates, an ambulance was called. The ambulance recorded sustained VT at 250 beats per minute with left bundle superior axis morphology. And here was his ECG. I'm not sure if we have Arthur back. If we do, Arthur, do you want to comment on this ECG? Oh, I'm not sure we have him. All right, I will do my best. So this ECG is characteristic of you know, relatively early stage of ARVC. You can see T wave inversions very prominently, V3, V1 to V3, and also in the inferior leads. All right, at the hospital, um, this gentleman also had a signal average ECG, which had noise that was a little higher than you'd like to see, but was nonetheless abnormal. His cardiac MR was of poor quality. 
Um, but you can see very clearly he had um, evidence of regional wall motion abnormalities, a reduced right ventricular ejection fraction, and an enlarged right ventricle meeting task force criteria. All right, genetic testing was sent just at the local facility and a small ARVC specific panel was ordered and no variant was detected. That wasn't necessarily shocking. Something between half and a third of ARVC cases are gene elusive, although you little, find a variant a little more commonly in a younger patient like this. Um, this patient was referred to our center for a second opinion at which point um, we ordered a broad panel that importantly included um, Del Duke evaluation, which had been missed the first time around. And turns out this individual did have a deletion in PKP2 encompassing exons two and three. So the importance of that part of the recommendation on full coverage, full coverage is really important, including Del Duke um, for desmosomal variants. All right, so ARBC was diagnosed in this patient, ICD was implanted. Uh, so the risk calculator that Dr. Vilda showed us, so the ARVC risk.com calculator said, all right, so this individual had already had a sustained VT, so we couldn't use the incident ventricular arrhythmia risk calculator, but he had a 14% five-year risk of one of those life-threatening arrhythmias of sudden death or fast VT, um, all of which was consistent um, with having an ICD implanted. This was not a difficult decision for the family. Uh, we initiated cascade testing as recommended, but our patient wanted to know, can I return to my water polo or swim team? And gosh, if I can't do that, can I at least work out? So using the guidelines, um, so this gentleman was definitely involved in endurance exercise. He was a swimmer here. That's a class C endurance sport. He was clearly um, you know, in competition. He was a high school varsity athlete. Um, and then, well, what do we know about these uh, activities, are they high intensity? Yes, they're high intensity. So water polo comes in at about a 10. Remember anything six or above is vigorous intensity. Uh, and competitive swimming ranges from 10 to 14 mets depending on stroke or whether you're training versus um, in a race itself. But nonetheless, these are high intensity activities. So probably not a good idea for him to do regularly. Then he says, well, can I just work out? Well. Certainly things in this lower realm of intensity is okay. And I think for ARVC patients, we're still trying to understand um, to what extent things like weight training um, are deleterious versus okay. All right, so we initiated cascade testing um, and uh, following the guidance, we were going to do this regardless of her genetic test result. And so this was done prior to us identifying the PKP2 variant in the family. And sure enough, as you can see here, the mom has an ECG also consistent with ARVC with TV conversions, B1 to B3. Um, even I can see very clearly that her right ventricle is enlarged uh, with evidence of um, you know, very clear wall motion abnormalities here. You can see with the red arrows, um, this gives her clearly a definite diagnosis of ARVC. And for her, she wasn't a huge athlete. Um, she was uh, way more concerned about to what extent she could continue to get the sort of benefits of daily exercise. Um, and I think that when we're having those shared decision conversations with families about exercise, um, it's important to keep in mind that many of the benefits of exercise, many of the health benefits, both physical and emotional, come um, with sort of more modest levels of exercise that won't necessarily help our competitive teenage swimmer who now has to uh, give up a key part of his identity and join a new social group. But in, in the parts of conversation about health and well-being, these lower levels of exercise are indeed beneficial. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up just um, throwing up acknowledgements to thank my colleagues both here and in the Netherlands um, who and the people whose names are bolded uh, played a role in some of the data I showed today. So I am going to wrap up and happy to take any questions or um, have a further discussion. I'm back. I'm sorry. I lost connection. But... It's all good. All right. Thank you both so much. Uh, that was Amazing, thank you for your presentation. Um, we don't have any questions yet, so um, 
Please feel free to enter any questions um, in the text box and our presenters will be able to answer them. We can wait. May, I, may I start and ask you a question? That is, so you mentioned uh, several times that you do uh, cardiological screening and genetic screening in all first degree family members. But would the approach uh, be uh, if you first do uh, genetic screening and then only investigate the affected individuals? Would that be okay? Um, would it be okay? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think we feel better with a baseline cardiovascular evaluation in everyone. Um, I think we've seen too many families, there's that 5% of families with multiple pathogenic variants. And so we're always afraid of missing a second one. Some of it has to do, I think, with how confident we are. All right, so if this is a classic right-sided ARVC family with a 21 P to C, we're confident. PKP2 variant. Yeah, and PKP2, uh, you know, PKP2 2146 G to C, very classic. We're very, very sure it's a pathogenic variant then it's probably less important to do cardiovascular screening in an older asymptomatic individual. I can't say we're, we're going to hew perfectly to the guidelines every time, but, but we're happy with a baseline evaluation. How do you practice? Well, we, 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 if we are sure about the pathogeneity of the variant, we only investigate the individuals who are carrier of the variant. We don't investigate the others, um, unless they have symptoms, of course. But. In reality, I think it's that's pretty close to what we do too. It, there's nuance though. So we do have um, quite a few questions. I said there were none and then they came flooding in all at the same time. Um, so, um, so one question that we have is, um, do you recommend repeat genetic testing at any point for patients with a VUS in the past? Uh, well, I'll start with that. Um, it's less about the VUS and more about how big the panel was that you were first tested on. Um, so we still have patients, you know, or we, we come upon patients that were tested, gosh, when it was a four gene ARVC panel. So yeah, obviously if you were a gene elusive patient on that tiny little panel, then yeah, that those individuals we would retest on. We actually just published a paper on that. Um, showing that as you go from a small ARVC Sanger sequencing panel, which is, of course, what we did 12 years ago, to now you increase the pickup rate, hmm, it's like 15 to 20 percent. Of course, you get tons more VUSs. So, yes, at those individuals, we redo it. Um, the VUS itself, uh, that wouldn't necessarily trigger another genetic test, it would trigger another look at the variant to make sure we still agreed with that classification. Um, and then, actually, this kind of goes with what you just said. For the elusive ARVC patients, how often do you reevaluate genetic testing for new genes? Um, it's going to depend on you know the extent of the panel that was initially ordered. So it's it's less about time and more about what's changed since then. Um, but it is our practice in clinic now. Certainly, if you had a small panel a long time ago and you're gene elusive to order the broader panel now. I think the addition that you made uh, is important that the analysis of duplications and insertions is important. And in the older panels that used not to be present, but that is certainly a relevant addition. Thank you. And then another question we got was about screening approach and um, what the age of individuals being offered cascade genetic and testing and cardiac screening is. So I would say that in, um, we don't start with very young children because I do believe that the disease is something that, well, in, in the very young, it is not a big issue unless the family has some cases and very young. So I would start from 10 year old. Um, and if, if you have a direct link, you may even include very old individuals, 
but if you have an 80, 70, 80 year old asymptomatic grandfather, um, maybe that's not the first thing to do, unless the link is through the grandfather in his family, uh, that there are other cases in that family and you're sure he's an obligate carrier. That's more or less what we do too. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, another question was, I mean, it's similar to what you had mentioned before about size of panels is for patients who meet or are close to a diagnosis of ARVC, do you prefer a larger cardiomyopathy panel versus an ARVC specific panel as long as it has the G&G listed? Um, yes, we prefer that. However, um, the, the, I've written this in papers. I've written this in the ClinGen ARVC paper in press right now that yes, we prefer that in our own practice, but in order to use that well, um, that's a situation where I think it's it really is critical that there is genetics interpretation expertise and whoever's receiving that result. We've had way too many misinterpreted tests on those large panels of patients sent to us and misunderstood tests. So, um, so I think it all depends on the expertise at the center ordering the test. And um, may I add that also the phenotype is critically important here. You can you are, can do that in those cases with a convincing phenotype, but when the phenotype is weak, you should not do a large panel. Okay, um, so, so um, someone said, thank you. we've got a lot of thank yous for this talk, by the way. So lots of people are very uh, uh, grateful for your expertise. Someone mentioned, um, for patients that have a highly suspicious, likely pathogenic variant, do you discharge family members that test negative? How do you counsel these patients if you think this is the cause, but there could be a possibility for reclassification in the future? I think we just discussed that. If, if you're really sure about the pathogenicity of the variant, and for some of these variants, let's say these truncating variants at PKP2 as the, as the boy had, uh, I think that's so clear and that will not be reclassified in the future. But if you're dealing with class four, uh, which is not 100% sure, then in those cases, you definitely need to to uh, consider the possibility of reclassification in the future. It might, might actually go both ways. It might actually be reclassified into a pathogenic class five, but it might also go the other way. Um, so in those cases, you need to, to keep an eye on, on potential reclassification. Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions more towards the psychosocial aspect of children who are young um, and diagnosed with a mutation and keeping them away from sports. Um, so how, how do you handle or how do you um, counsel these children? Not necessarily the parents, but the children. Yeah, it's so difficult. Um, Margo, could you clarify, are we talking about children like my, the 15 year old I described who they themselves are diagnosed? Or are you talking about at risk children? Um, at-risk children um, or also those who have been diagnosed. It looks like some of these are based off of a family mutation and then also those who have tested positive as well. People have asked both of those questions. Oh, someone said children under 10 as well. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, we don't, we don't especially restrict at sports. Arthur, I don't know what you guys do of, of children under 10. I mean, so if, if the family has chosen to do cascade testing for a child under 10, which we, we, we will facilitate, um, but that's, that's a shared decision with the family. That in and of itself is a counseling decision because, you know, as Dr. Vilda said, okay, we're gonna diagnose in a five-year-old, you're a carrier of the variant, but there's no, nothing medical you're going to do yet. Um, and so that's, that's a decision for the family. A lot of families do move forward with testing. Um, and for that child themselves, we, you know, they want to join the local soccer team in their six, go for it. We, we don't restrict that. I think some of the challenge is more um, families, parents will say to us, 
look, if this is coming, I don't want to build my, my child up onto the travel soccer team at 10 only to have to pull it. And so a lot of it's what are you going to do with that information? Um, for the kids themselves, my colleague Brittany Murray is a lot of counselor, she's really good at it, but, but a lot of it is setting expectations and talking about the family before the test and what are you going to do with this information? What does it mean to you? Is that getting at the question or is, am I missing the point of the question? I know I think that that definitely is um, getting to the point of the question. I think that extending expectations beforehand really answers that and making sure they understand what to do with it. Um, it's, it's very important that Cynthia emphasized that you really have these discussions before you do the genetic test or, or the cardiological test. So you really have to do it well before, give them some time to think it over and then do the test, not do it at the first consultation. Um, another person asked, what is recommended for pregnancy? Um, is a mother with ARVC at risk and should they be um, bed bound on bed rest? I think that all depends oh. on the uh, state of the disease uh, of the LV and RV function. Both, both are RV function also is very important here. If they are completely normal, I don't think there's any hesitation as to pregnancy, but if they are severely depressed, then that is a serious problem. Um, yeah, and it has to be counseled. I was going to say, we did um, yeah. a study actually together, Hopkins and, yeah. and the Netherlands did a study, and then there's been several other studies since then. For ARBC, that's overwhelmingly a good news story, except, as Dr. Vilda points out, for people that enter pregnancy already with significant LV disease, and then it acts more like titillated cardiomyopathy, but um, but but, but also RV disease. Uh, if yeah. you really have a wide RV, the pregnancy is yeah. an issue for the right ventricle as well because of the yeah. increased preload. Yeah. Um, and then I think we have time for probably like one more question, maybe. Um, I know we went over just a little bit, um, but the speakers speakers mentioned that they were willing to do so. Thank you. All good. You're fine. Yeah. Um, and um, someone asked, how often is a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation for ARVC de novo and not inherited? Oh, that's my favorite question. <laughs> Almost <laughs> never. Um, that That's another study we did with um, our friends in the Netherlands, our registry, and a group in Germany. Um, really, really rarely, the, the only, I mean, gosh, we did a study of more than 300 probands with desmosomal variants and three, or three clearly de novo variants. Two were relatively large deletions. And so that just makes sense. Of course, there's periodically going to be two. And then one is a case we've never been under, able to explain. Um, it's just a, a desmoglein two variant. Uh, actually, we also went on and did haplotyping. And somewhat to our surprise, um, these variants are on a limited number of haplotypes, and they're on haplotypes shared among those three countries, which, um, yeah, de novo variants are really, really rare. It's surprisingly rare compared to other diseases. Yes. We don't understand why that is. And it's actually kind of, well, and it's striking because, especially since you'd predict. Well, all right, that you'd predict be, um, because of the early sudden death that this would have a, a an impact, you know, it would have selective pressure. So you would expect a de novo rate. As, yeah, as Dr. Vilda said, I don't think we quite understand what's going on yet. Um, Very interesting that they just, it seems to be more stable or something, or that gene, or whatever, or these genes. I don't know. Um, do we have time for one more question or are we kind of pushing it? Okay. Yes. Um, so someone asked, is there any way to, to um, make the phenotype better to improve phenotype over time? So um, I think they meant to say dilation scars or fat contact. Like, is there any way to improve not, phenotype at all? Yet. Not yet. I think the, the the best you can achieve is to stabilize it, but there's no medication yet to improve it. There may be medication in the pipeline. There were data from from Boston with a new type of drugs, but I don't think clinical studies have started yet. 
Yeah, but there is some promise in the pipeline, but it's not yet the thing. Someone, someone just asked, is, are there any cures coming, any promising treatments? Uh, well, that is the drug that as I was referring to from a, a zebrafish screen in, in, uh, in Boston. Um, there is the idea that it, this medication works, but it has not made it into the clinic yet. Uh, that is the only thing I'm aware of, Cynthia. I'm not sure I missed something. Yeah, I, I mean, there's discussion of anti-inflammatory drugs, um, Arthur, because of some of the inflammation data. But as far as I'm aware, those are early animal model studies. They're, they're not, you know, we're years away. Um, there's also been talk, but certainly no studies in people or anywhere close to studies in people about whether um, desmosomal variants are potentially amenable to gene therapy, their loss of function variants. But again, that's, this is, you know, this is not a treatment in five years. This is maybe, this is many years out. Um, but yeah. Well, I think that's probably a good way to end it, <laughs> um, maybe. Um, but um, thank you both very much. Um, the, the audience was extremely engaged, um, so thank you. Um, and we even got requests for other upcoming uh, Educate Next for you guys. So, <laughs> um, so our next Educate Next is going to be on April 8th, um, A Path Towards Health Equity, The Pitfalls, Progress, and Possibilities. So please join us then, and thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Marco. Okay. Arthur, it's always a pleasure. This was fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.